No. <laughs> no. Absolutely not. Um, I took the title literally. Like, where are we now? <laughs> but that does... Re <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but that actually does relate to sort of the metaphorical sense of, like, where are we now as a society and where are we going? Uh, just some preliminary remarks, okay? Keep off your phone, including you over there. I was just sitting in the wings, and one of the uh, organisers of the event was actually on her phone. <laughs> we all know what the issue is, and we all experience it. And it relates to the title uh, of the festival that's, that's inspiring the festival. When you're online, you're kind of not here. You're smeared through space-time. And you feel that. I'm going to talk some more about that. But you feel that impoverishment of being in place the second you go online. Okay. So don't do it. <laughs> I've come all the way from London to speak to you. If you want to go online, you can go online and watch a TED Talk. Don't bother to leave your house and come to the blue coat. That's a big mistake. By placing your body in the room, you have committed to being in my presence, just as I've committed to being in your presence. And in a society that is increasingly typified by anonymous bonds rather than personalised ones, let's make this a little oasis of personal connection rather than a kind of mesalliance between the virtual <laughs> and the actual. Okay. So that's my first statement. What also enables me to be in place rather than distracted from where I am now is speaking without notes of any kind. Okay? I've been doing this for a number of years. Again, I'm not honouring you as an audience by coming here and reading a prepared text. I'm not honouring the spontaneity and immediacy of the moment. And, again, in a world that is increasingly typified by, in my view, an erroneous conviction that the World Wide Web is a map the same size as the territory it attempts to embody, people get very, very confused about where information is coming from exactly. And that's why I speak to you from my heart and from my mind actually in your presence, uh, rather than just giving you some prepared spiel. That leads me on to an, a problem. If you speak from memory, you forget. <laughs> many, many years of marijuana abuse. <laughs> and increasing age mean that my memory is not as accurate as I would wish. And I may not be able to summon up everything I wish to say to you in the course of the lecture. There will be a Q&A session afterwards, and I'm pretty confident that the things I forgot to say will then come up like a gigantic sort of wordy rake that I've trodden on and <laughs> smashed me in the face, and then I can share my pain with you. <laughs> The French have uh, an expression for this, uh, esprit de les escaliers, the hope of the stairs. You know the feeling you're leaving the party, somebody dissed you at the party, and suddenly that witty repartee, that bon mot, rises up, and you wish you could not be there now, but wind the clock back and find yourself in that position. So, hopefully, if I, if I forget anything, I don't say what I want to say, then we can catch up with it later on. So, where are we now? We're in Liverpool. Okay? We're in Liverpool. <coughs> One of the um, writers and, and artists who I most admire uh, in terms of their investigation of the nature of place and space is a man called Patrick Keeler. Some of you may be familiar with his work. He's made a trilogy of films called The Robinson Trilogy, London, Robinson in Space, Robinson in Ruins. I, I urge you to see them if you can. They're very important films. He also published a collection of essays a couple of years ago with Verso called A View from the Train. And again, I urge you to read it. It's a very, very valuable and important piece of work. 
uh, Penny was mentioning, I write for the London Review of Books. You'll find a long article from me about Keeler on their website, free to access. So that might be a good portal into his work. Patrick Keeler makes a point about Liverpool specifically. He's very interested in something called Phantom Rides, uh, the inception of film. Uh, one of the things that early filmmakers did quite a lot was just whack a camera on the front of a train or a tram and just let it film as the train or the tram move through the urban space. Easy to see why. The train or tram would be a level surface, so it would allow for the kind of smoothness of shot that you later get with dollies, but you couldn't get with early camera work. Keeler's point is, and there's a very, very famous film, Phantom Ride film of the Liverpool docks. So again, go online to the BFI site. It's free to view and have a look at this phantom ride of the Liverpool docks. And Keeler's point about this film is what you see in Liverpool in the early 1900s is this train, this camera on a train goes along the viaduct beside the docks is a sense of urban space that we no longer have, a sense of an interpenetration of working in domestic environments, a sense of the haptic and the handmade to the exclusion of the mechanised. Uh, Keeler makes a very eloquent point about this, which is that the irony of these Phantom Rides films, and you can see quite a few of them on the BFI site, is that they seem to bear witness to a kind of urban space that the camera itself was in the process of destroying, along with other mechanised technologies that essentially bowdlerized our urban space made it determined by high-speed transit systems and instantaneous communication systems, OK? They performed, if you like, the inception of these technologies in the 20th century, a colossal kind of cut and shut on our perception of the cities that we move through. And I think it's very easy to be deceived about that, because we sit here and we think, well, I, I kind of get what he's talking about, but... I walked here to the blue coat, or I know the city plan of Liverpool, or I understand the change of the city, I'm not living like that. But let's go back to that point about what we experience when we go online and the impoverishment of our actual bodies the minute we think we're connected to the World Wide Web. And then look at every technology of movement and communication that you're involved with. Every single one of them significantly alters your capacity to be here. Now, anybody who drives a car looks hundreds of metres ahead through a screen. Sometimes you get in an Uber nowadays. What a marvellous name for a word, world-girdling gig economic company. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the Brexiteers worry that a resurgent Germany is going to dominate the world. We already have Uber. <laughs> <laughs> you can sometimes get in an Uber and the poor driver will have the windscreen, the phone screen, the GPS screen, maybe a couple of other screens. People go get up in the morning, they step into their car, they look through a screen at the world, they get to work, they work on a screen, they come off that screen at lunchtime and check their social media sites on a little screen, then they go back to working on a screen, then they get back into their car and look through a screen, occasionally looking at a little rear view screen, then they get home in the evening and they get out of their screen mobile and go into their house and watch a screen. That's not really being here now. It's being in all sorts of spatio-temporal relationships, but it's not really about being here now. What I'd like to talk to you about is a method of being here now that will free you from what I think of as the man-machine matrix. This suite of technologies that has impoverished our ability to actually be here now, okay?
There's an intolerable sense of claustrophobia, or, or I certainly felt it, uh, as I felt the kind of nexus of these technologies closing in on me as I got older. Where are we now? We're in Liverpool. I remember first coming up here as an adult when I was working for Barclays Bank. And I remember going to a lunch with the directors of Barclays on Merseyside in 1988 in the Liver buildings. In a, they had a kind of rather palatial dining room up the top of one of the Liver buildings. And I remember standing with one of the directors of Barclays Bank looking out through this window over Liverpool and him sweeping his arm like this over the city, which at that time was in a pretty tricky state. I'm not going to do the accent. <laughs> he said, young man, we've just got to get rid of that bastard Hatton and then we will reassume control of this city and regenerate it. Obviously, that's always stayed with me. I'm staying in a hotel up on Hope Street. As I walk down here, I, of course, saw the distinctive finials of the Liver buildings up above the hugger-mugger of the centre of Liverpool. And that provided me with a parallax, OK? So you know what parallax is? The easiest example of it is if you look at the two finial tops of the Liver buildings, but you can't see the body of them, as you walk through the city, you will note that they change in relation to one another. That's your parallax, and that indicates where you are. We unconsciously seek out these parallax views uh, in the urban context in order to navigate, unless that is we're walking along like a zombie <laughs> looking at a screen, something I will return to in a moment. I'm not going to pretend that... I, I think I spent about three or four days up on Merseyside in the late 80s, so I'm not going to pretend any great knowledge of Liverpool during that period. But in terms of parallax, it was a very enlightening time because some of my work took me up to Southport, Lytham St Dan's, Morecambe, Morecambe Bay. And I remember thinking as I went up the Lancashire coast, there's a certain point just before Morecambe Bay where you can see the Lake District looming up ahead of you on the far side of Morecambe Bay. You need to know remarkably little about the map of England at that point for this to form a kind of huge parallax, for you not only to be able to locate yourself on the northeast coast of England, but to also apprehend the whole shape of the country around you. I mean, an even more egregious sense of this comes, if you're familiar with it, when you drive down the A9 uh, in Scotland, heading towards Inverness, and you look right across the Firth of Forth, then you can also really apprehend the whole shape of the landmass turning beneath you. And I kind of cherished that experience of the, the uh, Lancashire coast, for that very reason. It gave me one of my first intimations uh, of trying to be somewhere now simply by thinking about location and orientation. Okay? Place and space are not abstract categories ready to be filled with objects of a determinate size that exist in a determinate orientation to them. The Liverpool that a slave was brought to is not the Liverpool that I arrived at Lime Street this evening in. The Liverpool, even of 20 years ago, is clearly not the city that it is today. It's a very different place. When, in the early 2000s, I was friendly with an artist called Neville Gaby, or I knew this guy, and through something called the Liverpool Housing Action Trust, he had gained uh, the use of a 22-storey system-built tower block in Kensington, up behind Lime Street. And he offered a group of artists the use of apartments in this block to do something 
to do some kind of artwork, okay? Well, or he and Liverpool Housing Action Trust did. Liverpool Housing Action Trust, I don't know if it exists anymore, its job was to knock down tower blocks. Uh, my audiences, like me, are getting increasingly older, so most of you here will <laughs> remember a time when there were 90 multi-storey residential blocks in this city. Mostly gone. Liverpool Housing Act, well, in fact, I think all gone. Liverpool Housing Action Trust did its job well and knocked the lot down. I remember when I was staying in this one at Kensington, there were only two or three of these 22-storey blocks, system built actually by a French company called Camus. Interesting. <laughs> La Chute. Um, uh, there were only about, there were, I remember that in my one, I could see the one in Everton. I mean, naturally, I went for the, 20, the flat on the 22nd floor, from which I could see Snowden. Another great parallax, another great apprehension of where I was from up above Kensington. And I had, I had a folding bike I had up in the flat, and occasionally um, I would leap, I would get the bike, bang it in the lift, go down to the bottom, unfold it, jump on the bike, freewheel down, all the way down to Jerry's Ferry, Get on Jerry's ferry, listen to Jerry singing his bollocks as we went across the Mersey. <laughs> it's not funny. I don't know if they're still doing it. <laughs> um, it'd be like playing a sort of, I don't know. <sighs> Let's not go there. Get across to the other side, to the Wirral. Go all the way up the side to New Brighton on the bike. I'd be in New Brighton in sort of under half an hour. It's just an amazing sense of being in place of being in Liverpool. Even at that point in the early 2000s, the city still felt very hollowed out, central Liverpool. You know, I come from London, a city in which, you know, the population fell by a million and a half throughout the Second World War. It fell by a lot more here. It fell by 40% in the years after the Second War. And that sense of the city being cavernous is part of what being in Liverpool felt like, it seemed to me. Well, I'm not going to pretend to you that I'm some sort of, you know, scouse manke or anything like that or any kind of huge affiliation, but nor am I one of those Londoners that uh, never ventures into the north. I, I venture up here quite a lot. You'd perhaps prefer if I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I have spent a vast amount of my life in London, it's worse than that. It's worse than that. <laughs> a couple of years ago, 2016, three years ago, you remember that? 2016. It was such a good year to bury bad news. <laughs> the particular bad news that I feel very strongly was buried in 2016 was a little thing called the Chilcot Report. That was a long, very slow train coming. And when it arrived, nobody paid any attention to its arrival at all. But on the night that the Chilcot report was published, I went into the BBC in Portland Place to do an item with some of the major players who'd been involved in the Iraq war. So Claire Short was there, resigned in a very principled way over the uh, involvement with Iraq. Uh, some, uh, Rory Stewart was there, of course, who now a Tory minister, served as a provincial governor in Iraq under the occupation. General Sir Mike Jackson was there, sans eye bags. His valet was carrying them. <laughs> and I remember after the item... Um, I was with Mike Jackson and we were walking back into the wings of the studio and the item was carrying on and they were interviewing the guy and his name has just slipped my mind but somebody may remember it, who was the head of the Coalition Provisional Authority, the, Paul Bremer, yeah? Paul Bremer was on a little monitor being tracked in. He was not there then, let alone here now. He was being sort of, he was in some studio in the States and as we walked through the wings, Mike Jackson stopped and looked at the monitor with Paul Bremer on it very, very intently, 
like he'd seen something strange. And I stopped and I said, Mike, what gives, man? Because that's how you talk to a former head of the British Armed Forces. <laughs> if you're me. I said, Mike, man, what gives? He said, do you know, I've never, ever actually seen Paul Bremer. So let's get that straight. The head of the British Armed Forces at the time of the British involvement in the occupation of Iraq had never actually physically seen the head of the Coalition Provisional Authority. It makes you think, doesn't it? But that actually wasn't what I was <laughs> thinking about at the time. I then got in a cab and I was going back through London thinking a lot about how nobody gave a shit anymore about the blood that is all over the British political class because of the post-9-11 wars, about the moral turpitude that the political class of this country have been wading in thigh deep for years now. I wasn't really thinking about that. I was thinking about how much of my life I'd spent in London. <laughs> and I had this kind of awful epiphany as the cab was going back through the West End. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the idea, you know, what Einstein called the block universe. Yeah? So Einstein conducted this thought experiment where he tried to compress all four dimensions, including time, into two, or even possibly three, but arguably two, okay? How do you do that visually? Well, it's, it's not that difficult, actually. Think about it. You do it with turning three dimensions into two the whole time because you're constantly looking at pictures of one kind or another. Oh, what happened to my picture, wow fest? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where, where that had gone to. But say this picture here, right? You know that that pipe is further away than this man, right? So you're well used to seeing three dimensions in two, okay? So think about seeing four dimensions in two or three, okay? So try and imagine your being in place as being a vertical dimension and it's mapped onto a standard map, say, of Britain, okay? Or, in my case, of London or of the world, okay? So all the time you've spent is represented by a higher mound, if you like, because that's the best way of conceiving of it. When I had my epiphany of the Einsteinian block universe of my own life, I saw that in central London, like zones one or two, there was an enormous sort of shit pile of my existence. And the other places I'd been, like I was at university in Oxford, I lived in Suffolk for a while, I lived outside Oxford, I lived in an island in the Orkneys for a winter, I was in Australia for nine months, I'd been in the States for a year. All of these other places were just like the mound dribbled off into the distance in that way, okay? But really, the main gig was like there, this dump of being in London. And it made me feel even more shit and claustrophobic than I did already. So I suggest you do that exercise for yourself. <laughs> because we're talking about being here now. And my suspicion is many of you may be in relation to Liverpool the way I was in relation to London. Terrible sense of claustrophobia. Terrible sense that, you know, people often think black cabbies are rooking them in London when they get into the cab, but that shows a misunderstanding of how the cabbie's meter works. It's cross-correlated between time and distance, so if the cab slows down, it starts acting on time below a certain point. If it speeds up, it starts to act on distance. It is not in the cabbie's interest to cheat you. Anyway, London cabbies, as you know, have the knowledge which is the name of every single street and notable building within a six-mile radius of Charing Cross, where, incidentally, I was born. Okay? That is a spatial knowledge that is so great, that is so much information, that if you put a London licensed London taxi driver in an MRI scan, you can see 
that her or his posterior hippocampus is in fact enlarged. In other words, the part of the brain that is concerned with orientation has actually grown under the influence of this. So, we've all got a meter in our heads. Even when you were coming here this evening, you calculated at some level the time and the distance and the cost of your journey. The time in terms of what it would represent if you were working. I would argue that there isn't a single journey that you undertake that doesn't involve a cost analysis going on. Running like some weird autonomic economic process behind your conscious mind. No wonder we feel claustrophobic. No wonder we find it hard to be where we are because being where we are has been traduced to the point of just trying to get from A to B in the quickest possible time. Okay, digression. Some people run marathons, some people go to the gym. When you go to the gym, you exercise looking at somebody else's tensed buttocks. You exercise in an antiseptic environment chosen for you by Sir Richard Branson's Imagineers. You walk to nowhere on a treadmill. You elect to be a human fucking hamster. <laughs> but I run marathons. Do you now? Looking at millions of buttocks <laughs> joggling ahead of you. Is this the kind of conoscipients that you really desire? Is this a way of being where you really are? The fanatical training runs, followed by the big event itself? It's not really about being in place, and nor is it about enjoying your body in place, either. It's another metric. It's another achievement. It's another expenditure of energy. And implicitly, a lot of performance sport commoditizes the body treats of it in terms of how much things are going to cost, how much time can be allowed for it, objectifies it. I must have a body beautiful. I must look good, better than my age. Why? Why? My body is an ornament. No, it isn't. It's a body. It's a body. Don't treat it like an ornament. During Italia 1990, the slogan was, eat football, drink football, live football. I smoked some football. <laughs> it was very harsh. And I haven't repeated the experience. In my middle years, I found myself in a dark wood. That claustrophobia really bore down on me. And I thought, we don't really know where we are. I found myself in my late 20s standing in a street in central London in Mayfair and I had this sudden epiphany. I thought to myself, I have never seen the mouth of the river that runs through the city of my birth, even though it's only 30 miles away. Not only that, I don't think I've ever even seen a representation of it visually. And I thought to myself, if I went 30 miles from the mouth of the Amazon and found some sort of peon working his manioc patch on the side of the river and said, hey, peon, what is it like at the mouth of the big river? And the peon said, I do not know. I have never been there. I would thought, what a pig ignorant peon you are. <laughs> but aren't we all really like that? Have we not been rendered ignorant of where we are precisely by those technologies of convenience that force us into this endless metric of calculating time, distance, and money? That day, I got in my car and I drove to the mouth of the Thames. And it was the beginning of, and it didn't look anything like I thought it would, and it was the beginning of an interest in interzones, edgelands, the edges of cities, ways of getting to the edge of the map in order to understand where I was, and also to break that compartmentalization of my life. And that's gone on. It's gone on and, and become more and more baroque and inventive as I've become increasingly claustrophobic, trapped within 
this man-machine matrix. Of course, this was long before the inception of what I think of as bi-directional digital media, and, and that is what characterizes the suite of technologies we call the web and the internet. I believe that by practicing aimless travel. That was quite good, though. I like that. <laughs> we can realize our own autonomy. We can become free. By stepping away from the man-machine matrix, by busting that metric, we can actually realize a great deal of autonomy, which you won't get following Greta Thunberg, I can assure you. And I'll come to that probably in the Q&A. But let me just bury this thought. When was the last time that a children's crusade really worked? Um, I teach what's called psychogeography at Brunel University. The term psychogeography derives from a small Marxist group of school called the Situationists who were founded in the late 1950s in Paris. And their signature technique was what they called the derive, the drift, or random progress through the city, simply walking off into the city, going like a will-o'-the-wisp where your mood or your fancy takes you. It's actually surprisingly hard to do. It really is. We are so conditioned to have a purpose. We so think that's our function in the world, to have a purpose. We so think that that is how we are here now, or why we are here now. I couldn't get up in the morning if I thought I couldn't make a difference. Well, you don't. <laughs> Stay in bed. <laughs> I, Naomi Klein, couldn't get up in the morning if I didn't think I was making a difference. You're not, Naomi. The only difference you made was you've taken another jet flight and dumped a load of pollutants into the air in search of a greener planet. I couldn't get up in the morning. Don't. Stay in bed. Sometimes I'm in bed in the morning, and instead of getting up, I actually climb inside the duvet cover by mistake. <laughs> and then I just stay inside there all day, shaping the sweaty duvet into a simulacrum of this world. <laughs> That's just as believable. So, practice the derive, but practice the derive against a background of understanding the environment you're in. In order to get this realization of autonomy and this sense of freedom, you have to be able to let go of something. So you have to know where you are before you can let go of where you are and before you can actualize your sense of liberation and autonomy. And that's what I've been trying to practice much more assiduously, I think, since my late 30s, I, the last 20 years, I've, I've really gone at it in a way. And Penny was talking about some of my uh, odder practices, like uh, walking to Heathrow. I actually just set out to walk. To, I was doing a series for British Airways, very uneco-friendly, this, where I would fly. It's when I started, sorry, I gave up all of my pernicious habits in the 90s. And then I had, like, it was like reacquainting myself with my body, like having this big dog that needed to be exercised all the time. I started doing this series for British Airways where I'd fly somewhere in Britain and then take a long country walk and then fly back again in the evening. <laughs> How messed up is that? <laughs> just to round off the series, I thought, well, I'll just walk to Heathrow. And my eco-conscience was starting to get on me. I walked to Heathrow. People say, oh, did, how'd you get there? Did you go along the M4? No! Of course I didn't go along the M4. I'm not a cretin. <laughs> oh, what did you do with your luggage? Well, I wasn't flying on that occasion, but that's what people mostly used to ask me about the airport walks. What did you do with your luggage? Oh, well, I took on bearers. <laughs> I took on bearers. They carried my 22-piece Sansomite luggage set with my many Shantong silk suits in it. 
It's a lovely wall to Heathrow. There are several, many ways of doing it. Say what you will about London, it's quite a green city. You can walk from where I live in, in sort of south central <coughs> London to Heathrow, two main routes without doing more than two or three miles on public roads at all. Canals, green spaces, the side of the Thames, Hounslow Heath, all of this stuff. You can get there. It's quite a lovely walk. It's a full day's walk. Obviously, the first time I did it, I got to that tunnel that goes under the runways, and there was a big sign by it saying, no pedestrian access, go back to the Renaissance. <laughs> Which I thought was weird. But the Renaissance is actually a hotel on the periphery road. <laughs> where you get the shuttle bus from. <laughs> the next time I did it, I, I flew to New York, and then I walked from JFK to Manhattan. OK, that really worked. I arrived at JFK at night, walked out of the airport, a bit tricky, a lot of, lot of uh, freeway overpasses, stayed the night in Jamaica, Jamaica being the district outside JFK, and then, and then walked into Manhattan the following day. When I got to my hotel in Manhattan, my body said, that was amazing, you've been walking for two days. Um, man, Long Island must be coextensive with the southeast of England. And my head said, I think, body, you will discover that there was a 3,000-mile plane flight in between those two days of walking. And my body said, we've been walking a bit longer than you've been thinking. We've been walking for several million years. You've only been thinking for about the last five minutes. What do you know? Because that's how strong the body is. Where are we now? For all the madness that gets into our heads, we're right here, still in the blue coat in Liverpool. Reacquaint yourself with your body, why don't you? Breathe. Tense your muscles. It's difficult when you're sitting down. The temptation is to think that you're like those heads in Futurama that have been chopped off <laughs> and are being, yeah? And a lot of our screen-based you know, mass transit system dominated culture encourages us in this kind of headless view of what we are. Reactivate your body. Be with your body. Be here. Now. Now. Or then. Be here then. John Gray, the philosopher, says, in the city, the human individual may feel herself to be but a shadow cast by the buildings. But to experience that evanescence, you have to actualize your physical being, your being in place. And you have to actualize your sense of history, your sense of what that place is, what its meaning is for you, what its meaning is for other people. You have to develop a parallax that isn't just spatial, but is cultural social, political, historical. Place is deeply resonant. When the railway was introduced, places really did become closer together in a very, very meaningful sense. What encourages us to persist in the delusion that we live in a kind of pure Euclidean space a determinate space that can just be sliced and diced arithmetically is the phone. The phone that everybody has in their pocket and the GPS technology that it's connected to. So GPS technology developed in the wake of the carpet bombing campaigns of the Second World War, which was seen by the United States Air Force and its planners to be very, very wasteful. Not of human life, though millions were killed, but ordinance, very wasteful of ordinance. The ambition was to develop a pinpoint accurate system of spatial location that would enable American bombardiers to put five bombs in one hole. That was the accuracy they were aiming for. Proto-GPS systems were coming into being in the late 50s, into the 1960s, and there was a workable system in the early 70s, but it didn't go online 
until 1980. I think we should really date the modern era. You want to know where you are now? You're in the year PGPS 39. Okay? That's where we are now. That, it is that important, this technology. Okay? Some people like to believe that technologies are value neutral. I think they are in this sense, they're kind of beyond good and evil. But it is instructive, surely, that this is a technology that was developed to establish where people are with pinpoint accuracy and then kill them. Okay. GPS system is still managed by the Americans National Security Association. Okay. So the spooks connected to that little phone in your pocket. Every time you turn it on, you're logging on to their system, and they are identifying your location potentially within a cubic grid that encompasses the entire Earth, that is continually positionally updated in order to account for Maxwell's equations, for the divergences in space-time due to Einstein's theory, everything like that. But what they want at the end is that pure cube so you can be located in it, okay? So the technology that you're relying on for so much of the time is actually imprisoning you in an aseptic and determinate space that allows no free play for your imagination at all. When you come out of the station and you think, how do I get to the blue coat? And you log on to Google Maps and you begin to identify with a little blue dot. What am I? I don't identify as a middle-aged white man of mixed Jewish uh, ancestry. I identify as a small blue dot. And I walk along the road looking at the small blue dot, and I wonder why the fuck it is I feel hopelessly lost. I feel hopelessly lost, and it's particularly shameful amongst those of us who remember a time before this technology perfectly well, okay? I'm shamefully lost because I'm neglecting all of those abilities that I have to orient myself. I'm neglecting to look at road signs. I'm neglecting to feel the wind on my cheeks. I'm neglecting to notice which side of the tree the lichen grows. I'm neglecting to talk to people in the street and ask them directions. I'm neglecting to look at the street. I'm neglecting everything but the little blue dot. And I feel hopelessly lost. GPS technology offers you absolute location and no orientation whatsoever, okay? Absolute location and no orientation. That's where we are now. That's where we are. Think of that as an expansive metaphor for our current political, social, philosophical impasse. You don't have to be an evolutionary psychologist to believe that The journey is the paradigm of narrative. In fact, I would divide all stories into two kinds. God's stories and where's the food stories. Okay? God's stories are explaining to the other AP people why it is that the thunder goes off all the time and why it is that Stig's baby exploded shortly after it was born. That's God's stories, stories that explain the inexplicable. They can be written by men with names like Kant and Schopenhauer, women with names like Arendt. Doesn't matter. And then there are where the, where's the food stories, which is just about everything else. It's the hero's journey. It's the, you know, whatever. Okay. Google Maps does away with where's the food stories. You just put in restaurant near me <laughs> and then follow the blue dot. Sort of does away with God's stories as well because it provides us with a sense of transcendence or of kind of false belief in transcendence. 
and it encourages us to do without our memories of where the food is and do without our memories of all the books we've read and do without our memories of our own past and live in a kind of permanent now that is defined by bidirectional digital media. The analogy between the sense of being lost when you identify with the blue dot when you come out of the station and the way you feel lost in the mass of imagery and information provided by the World Wide Web are entirely analogous. As long as you're rooted in that technology, you are truly lost and truly manipulable. Not good. Not good at all. How am I doing for time? Five. Is that, you're saying five minutes, right? Are you now? Okay. So, yeah, I've been thinking about this for a long time now and writing about it. The, the trilogy of novels I've, I, I finished uh, in 2017, predictably with a novel called Phone, are about the relationship between technology, psychopathology, and war. Because that's what I think is the real dialectic that lies behind human evolution in the last couple of centuries and even longer. No technological in innovation comes from anywhere but our desire, as Marshall McLuhan, the cultural theorist, put it, to effect action at a distance, usually in order to kill people. <laughs> the other apes who smell funny over the other side of the bushy escarpment. Monkey see, monkey kill monkey. Monkey do. It's beyond good and evil. The idea that we're going to control this technology is absolutely laughable. Take as a baseline year, say, 1925, there were maybe 150 men and women in the world at that point who understood that a nuclear fission bomb could be built. None of them wanted to do it. They all understood that it was an absolute nightmare. Lo and behold, 20 years later on the 6th of August, little boy was dropped on Hiroshima with an instantaneous loss of 150,000 lives. Men, women, children, largely civilians. So that just doesn't wash. If you hear anybody talking about how they're going to control technology or harness technology, they're blowing it out of their ass. It makes us crazy. We're yoked, you know, like slim pickings at the end of Dr. Strangelove. We're astride the bomb riding it down, and it makes us feel very crazy. It makes us feel mad and psychotic. I'd argue, in fact, that we can date the modern era from GPS, or we could date it from the decision of one Commander Archipov to refuse Khrushchev's order to fire his missiles during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1963. We're really living in kind of Archipov time, in a way. Or we could date it from the 6th of August, 1945, because I'd argue that everybody who was born after that date was born into the most colossal double bind. A double bind is when somebody places you in an impossible emotional predicament. It's like a mother saying to a small child, I love you, in a hatey, aggressive voice. It splits the child. We're all like that. Because our government, right, who we look to, to love us, and care for us and nurture us and provide us with our lovely National Health Service and our lovely MRSA superbugs, uh, is at the same time stockpiling the means of our destruction. It's no wonder we feel so unhappy about that. So, log off. I used to be wary of coming out against bidirectional digital media. Nobody wants to be branded a Luddite. And I'm not a Luddite. I think it's a waste of time trying to get rid of your phones or get rid of your technologies. But that doesn't stop you making the radical and autonomous decision to shut it off, 
to abandon the metric <coughs> and to move through space and through time under your own volition or under random influences that will open you out to the world in another way, that will re-engage you with your poor body, which you've sadly neglected, except occasionally feeding it some antibiotics to try and keep it alive. And it will re-engage you with what we might think of fluvial time instead of that permanent now that the web and the internet seem to represent to us, a kind of democratization, if you like, of the zeitgeist that kind of fools. That's why we keep logging on, isn't it? Ooh, alerts. Ooh, ping. I'm part of that. Ooh, I like that. I hate that. I'd like to kick his head in. Oh, I'm not trolling. I only trolling blue dots. I mean, after all, if you identify with a blue dot, how can it matter what you do? You're just splatting other blue dots. Well, we can talk about it a bit in the queer, in the, the que, where, did that, where did that syllable come from? In the Q&A. But you know, I don't want to go against the spirit of Wowfest too much. But sometimes, you know, you've just got to not do something and sit there. Except getting up and going out for a good walk. Thank you. Thank you.